and NASA to build clouds that are massively scalable and simple to implement. Now, that idea is empowering a community to change an industry. But technology alone is just technology. Technology alone does not ignite change. Technology alone does not push society forward. People do. And by developing technology openly, more people can participate. There are thousands of engineers and hundreds of companies working together to help our collective customers move forward, to help solve the unsolvable at a rate of innovation that could never be accomplished by one organization alone. Together we press forward. Together we change the game. Thank you all for being here. I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. And I'd like to thank you for hosting me here today. I'm very excited about the work we're doing together and I appreciate your forethought uh, in leadership. You know, I'll spend some time talking about the state of open source today, but as we talked about earlier, certainly while there are benefits around uh, cost um, with using open source software, you know, the primary biz, uh, benefit is around innovation. So you're really setting a platform going forward um, to allow for great uh, innovation uh, in the public sector, and we're pleased to be able to play a small part of that. So thank you for your leadership, uh, and we appreciate uh, being partnered with you in this journey. I'm going to speak very, very little about technology today, because what I'd really like to talk about is why we're seeing just the explosion of technology around us uh, over the last uh, several years. So much is talked about the what is happening and much less time is actually spent on why it's happening now. What's, what's enabling just the massive progress uh, that we're having uh, in technology. And I want to start off with an analogy because I do think there are three different things uh, that are happening simultaneously, and they're all related, but they're slightly different. And I'm going to start with an analogy for uh, around the Industrial Revolution. And I'm doing that for a couple of reasons. First off, obviously Bilbao and, and the Basque region is a, an iconic area for uh, uh, industrialization, for manufacturing of all uh, types of goods. And you talked about actually many of the ships that were uh, used to discover America were built uh, here. And so I think it's important to start with kind of the economy as it's been um, uh, over the last uh, couple hundred years in the Industrial Revolution and go from there to talking about the parallels because they're really uncanny. So bear with me just for a couple minutes on a history lesson. I uh, hope some of you are interested in history and then I'll, I really will come back to why I think it's uh, important uh, in terms of the amazing parallels we see. So this is a picture of an old textile plant in England around 1750. Right? And most people when they think of the Industrial Revolution, they think of something that looks kind of like this. And the beginning of the Industrial Revolution is typically thought of to have begun around 1750. But if you dig underneath the Industrial Revolution, what you find is this frankly didn't matter that much. And here's what I mean by that. If you look in context of human history and our ability to generate output, so GDP per capita, so gross domestic product, or output per person. If you look way back over time, from the birth of Christ, to 1750, so when that factory was built, there was very little change in the output per person in what we now think of as the industrialized world, so Europe and, and America. There was very little change over 1750 years. When you think about that, 1750 years, and there was almost no change in humans' capacity to generate output, stuff, food, 
shelter, uh, the various things we need in life. Now, people get excited when they talk about the Industrial Revolution because that supposedly changed everything. But here's the dirty little secret of the Industrial Revolution. Between 1750 and 1870, human output per person, or GDP per capita, only increased 50%. Now, in some ways, you would say 50% increase is pretty good when you've done nothing for 1,750 years. But the reason I bring it up is something really amazing happened around 1870. Let's skip this slide here. Starting in 1870, the industrialized world, so Western Europe and the U.S. is the way I did the, the, the quantification around this, output per person or GDP per capita started doubling every 30 years. And it has continued to double every 30 years since seven, uh, 1870. So to put that in context, in the 30 years after 1870, we made more progress in terms of our ability to produce as a society than we were able to do in the first 1870 years. And we continue to do it and doubled and doubled and doubled again. So it does make you kind of scratch your head and say, well, what happened around 1870 that all of a sudden led to just this massive explosion of innovation and our capacity to produce things and build the economies that we have today. And I wish I could absolutely answer that question. I actually have a theory of three things, and I'll talk about them, but I've presented this so many times to so many economists, they've added two more. So there are kind of five things that one can argue were the components that made it up, and we can argue about them. And I'll mention them, but that's the less important part. They're basically, first off, the... Um, uh, invention of the auto lathe and the ability to make standardized piece parts, right? Because that was critical to, um, for almost any other level of production. Right? Before the auto lathe, you know, individual parts had to be made and crafted. Um, and so if one part broke in a factory like I showed on the prior page, somebody had to machine tool that exact part. You didn't have standardized parts because we didn't know how to make them. Um, certainly the internal combustion engine and the ability to have portable common power a railroad system that allowed transportation that was standardized and relatively inexpensive around uh, 1870 reached a critical mass where the majority of the world, uh, in terms of buying population, the majority of the GDP of the world was covered by a common communication or a transportation system. Um, the other two that people have asked me to add over time is the Bessemer steel process, the ability to build really strong kind of uh, um, product out of, out of metal, and electrification, which is important in terms of general power. Now, I want to spend less time on any of those individual components and more to say that what started off the Industrial Revolution and the principles around making things at scale really didn't have a big impact on the world until we got a set of standard components on which people could build. And I would argue much of what we are seeing today in information technology has very, very similar roots. If you want to think of that factory I showed a couple pages ago, the, the old 1870, think of that as a big old mainframe. Right? And our ability over time, a common transportation system for information around the internet, you know, common engine around you know, x86 processors, uh, cloud now, so a common broad architecture like electricity on which you can have a utility to be able to pull compute resources. Once those things in place, that's when we saw an explosion of innovation. And I bring that up really because I think there are three fascinating aspects. And if I had two hours, I would go through all of them in detail. So I promise I won't torture you with that. Uh, but there are three fascinating aspects uh, that are worth talking about with the Industrial Revolution. And I'll come back with the Information Revolution. First off is just those factors, right? The Bessemer steel process and the other kind of components are fascinating to talk about. And it's a lot like talking about the technologies about Moore's Law or Kreider's Law. Uh, in, uh, um, in uh, uh, disk storage and uh, various interesting new technologies, you know, IPv6, and except 
fascinating technologies in the same way there were a set of, of fundamental technologies that allowed the Industrial Revolution to happen. There are fu fundamental technology and you know, cloud computing and the principles around that are fascinating to talk about is the underlying components that allow this to happen. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. Fascinating conversation and hopefully a lot of what this and other uh, conferences around technology talked about. The second, and probably my favorite one, which hint I'm not going to talk about today too, is the explosion of innovation that getting these common piece parts allowed. Right, so if you think about when Henry Maudsley invented the autolave, which allowed for common parts, I don't think he had any idea over the next hundred years that that would lead to the internal combustion engine. And the internal combustion engine would lead to planes, trains, and automobiles. The explosion of innovation that can happen as soon as you have commonality is extraordinary. And that's what we're seeing in technology today, right? Developers can develop applications, whether those are in government, whether those are Uber or Airbnb or many of the applications that we all use every day. Those developers didn't have to worry about what underlying technology stack and a lot of the underlying issues that go underneath that. They didn't have to worry about, well, how am I going to distribute this out to people and what's the common platform it's going to run on, right? As we built those common platforms and a set of standards, now developers can just innovate, right? The average person has five times as many applications on their smartphone as they have on their computer. Why? Because it's easy, right? It's easy for developers to write it, it's easy to consume. And we're seeing a massive explosion of innovation. Those are the things that will truly be life-changing for all of us. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Again, that's a fascinating thing to talk about. I actually want to come back underneath it and talk about why it's all happening and why it's happening at such a rapid rate. And that comes down to how innovation is happening. And the final thing that we don't really talk a lot about with the Industrial Revolution, but it is a fundamental deep enabler for the Industrial Revolution to happen. It's a fundamental deep enabler for this next generation of information technology. And that's, as soon as you have those common functions underneath, users get to drive innovation. And that is a critical, critical component of the Industrial Revolution. And that's why if you want to say 1870 and the Industrial Revolution was that inflection point, that's why today it's like 1870, we're at an inflection point with information technology. Because users all of a sudden have the capability to drive their own innovation. When you think about the winners of the Industrial Revolution, you don't think about the people who make the machine tools, right? You think about the people who used the machine tools and perfected mass manufacturing. Right? It was originally you know, Henry Ford who perfected the assembly line. This is a random picture of airplanes. I don't know why my marketing people picked that, but it's a pretty cool picture. Um, in general, it is manufacturers, the users, who started to drive their own innovation. Why would we think it would be any different in the information revolution? Sure, between 1750 and 1870, the people who started building those tools played a prominent role. But as soon as those became relatively common, it's the users who play a common uh, role. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing if you go from mainframe to client server to kind of internet to cloud today. We're going from where the manufacturers drove innovation in a very closed way to users driving it in a very open way. So I would argue the, the fundamental reason we're seeing this inflection point is not just because, oh, we have common infrastructure, it's because on that common infrastructure, users can now drive their own pace of innovation. Now I just picked three users here, and I picked these because they were easy quotes that one could pull. And when I say users, I don't mean exclusively users like this, but without a doubt, the explosive growth of Web 2.0 companies has led to just an explosion of innovation that we're seeing in technology. 
you know, Facebook, Google, PayPal, but you can look at Yahoo, Twitter, LinkedIn, Amazon, across the board, these are large IT users who have the financial capacity and the technical capability to drive their own roadmaps. And frankly, they're not waiting for vendors. Right? These are users who when they find a problem, work to solve it themselves. And I'll get into specific technologies here in just a minute. But across the board, the reason that in most new areas of computing, innovation is happening first in open source is not because of vendors like Red Hat, but because of users like these who've decided they're not going to wait and try to explain to a vendor what their problem is and then try to get a vendor to write a solution. They just do it themselves. You know, I was talking to the CTO, and I don't know if I'm not to let's say, of one of those companies up there. I'll leave it at that. And I said, so why do you do all of your work in open source? And he gave me a really interesting answer to that. He said, for us, it's a moral obligation. And I thought, wow, like this, this person should be a red hat, right? They're really passionate about open source. And he said, no, no, no. He said, in all honesty, it's not about open source. He said, if we have any technology that can help anybody run their computing, their data centers more efficiently, burn less electricity, right? be better for the world and the environment, it is our moral obligation to give that away and really work to get others to adopt those technologies. Right? Think how different that is than the traditional mindset of a traditional IT vendor saying, we have a great idea, how do I package it up, lock it up, and sell it to other people? Right? These are people saying, we have this great technology that can make everybody more efficient. Not only am I willing to give it away, I'm actually going to act, go out there and try to get people to adopt it. Now, I've talked in particular about the web companies because we all know their names, but it extends well past the web companies. When I look, at least for Red Hat, in our customer base, we have a tremendous number of customers who decide to get involved in uh, upstream open source projects. And they do it, some say, there's a set of features that I need for my industry that aren't in the technology I want to use. And I understand that Google or Facebook doesn't care about my needs as a bank, so I'm going to do them myself. Others do it and say, I can't attract the best and the brightest IT talent if I don't let them work in open communities. That's happening in a big way around the world. And, and it really is permeating out. It really kind of started in California and it's worked its way out. And, you know, if you haven't looked, I'd encourage you to go to any of these companies or go to LinkedIn or any of these. And type in the name of the, type in LinkedIn and open source. And they all have pages on open source talking about the projects they're working on and trying to get more people involved. And they will all say one of the reasons we do this is we cannot attract and retain the best and the brightest if we don't let them be involved in open communities where they get a chance to show what they can do, uh, build their own brands over time. Now, because of this, I would actually argue that sometime in the last couple of years, and it's hard to put the exact date on these things, we hit an inflection point where more innovation is happening first in open source. Right? Now, I kind of hesitate to put this slide up here because, I'll be honest, it's wrong. And it's wrong in the sense of the open innovation line at this point is not linear, it's exponential. With the growth and the number of connections happening, we're seeing an exponential growth in the number of projects, certainly lines of code, et cetera, et cetera. And this isn't meant to measure lines of code. This is actually meant to, to measure real fundamental deep innovation. And the simple example I'll use on that is, look at something like big data, right? Everybody talks about big data and the importance of big data, but frankly, name an innovation in big data that's not an open source. Right? Whether it's Hadoop or Cassandra, all the NoSQL language. And I think it shows something else about the power of user-driven innovation. And that's simply, it's not just that users are involved, 
but that there's so many users now that you get a little bit of the benefit of crowdsourcing meets user-driven innovation. And so the one thing I can tell you for certain is many of those projects are going to fail. But the power of the open innovation model is that some will succeed rather than a few vendors each placing a bet or two, so there are 10 different bets around big data done in a proprietary way with five years of, of roadmap around it. There are thousands, and those thousands will get culled down into hundreds, which we call down into dozens, which will get called down into probably five or six, which will become the backbone of the next generation of analytic and big data that, that enterprises will use. It's a little bit like planting thousands of seeds. Right? You know most of the seeds are going to die. That's not the point. The point is the best and the strongest will survive and thrive. And the other power about the fact that it's user-driven is the ones that will survive and thrive aren't necessarily the ones that are owned by a company with the biggest marketing budget, but they're going to be the ones that users naturally have gravitated to and use. Now, seeing this happen at scale, I will say, I got to have one of the greatest jobs in the world because I get the, the front row seat to watching all of this happen. And you go out and you talk to some of the, the especially the big web companies, just the whole rate, rate and way that open innovation happens, it's extraordinary. So rather than thinking about in terms of months or years in a roadmap, right, these companies think in terms of days and weeks of needing to get features into their fundamental infrastructure, their core infrastructure for a feature they want to launch on the site, you know, next week, next month, and developers pulling all-nighters to do that. And that, the concept, not just of open user-driven innovation, but the, the way it actually works, where it is small, very, very small, iterative improvements, which when collected together using the kind of of how social technology around open source leads to just these massive waves of technology. And I was picking one up here, which is obviously well known, which to do, right? Started off as a paper that Google wrote. Yahoo picked it up. It now has contributors in several dozen countries and several hundred organizations. All doing tiny, tiny, tiny little uh, additions, uh, which in total have led to a technology that is really creating a whole new industry uh, around analytics uh, and big data. And again, I made this point specifically around uh, big data, but it's true in most new areas of computing. It, whether it's cloud, and I guess, you know, other than vCloud, uh, virtually everything happening in cloud is happening first in open source. Or big data, and again, there's hard to come up with a proprietary innovation that's happened in big data. It's all happening first in open source. If you look at cloud apps, you know, Docker and all the new things that are happening around containers, again, all happening first uh, and, and almost exclusively in open source. And then the proprietary vendors are running to try to catch up and figure out how you address it. You know, mobile and all the things happening around mobile and mobile applications. Again, all happening and happening first uh, in open source. Right? And I think this is a really important for all of us, and Red Hat kind of is a leader in some of these technologies to make sure that we continue to tell this story. Because to be honest, I think the when I go out and talk to customers, Red Hat customers or prospective customers, I'd say the, the biggest um, uh, blocker that I get is, okay, I get that open source is a viable alternative now. I get the fact that it's safe, it's reliable, it's secure, it runs stock exchanges, got it. But isn't it just kind of a 80-20 kind of copy of proprietary software? You know, isn't this just a way that I save money? And really, as I, I work with more sophisticated customers, and the message we have to send now is, well, it does save you money because you're not paying for the intellectual property, and so yes, it's cheaper, but it's more innovative. It's where innovation is happening. It's where companies can either drive their roadmaps or be able to consume where and how innovation is happening. You know, the example I'll use you know, with our Red Hat customers is one of the benefits of using Linux, again, whether it's Red Hat Linux or a free Linux or whatever you might be using, is you know that there's a massive community working to innovate on top of it. I can tell you now, Red Hat had no idea 18 months ago that Docker was going to emerge as a major fundamental different way to build and deploy applications. The good news is we didn't need to. 
What we needed to do is make sure we're involved in the community around Linux where innovation is happening. So ultimately our customers will get the benefit of Docker containers and the power of that. Not because our customers were that smart or Red Hat's that smart, but because we are in the communities where that innovation is happening. And so, of course, we work to then make it consumable for enterprises, but importantly, it is where uh, new innovation is happening um, in these areas and others. And more and more, our leading customers will say, I'm buying open source, again, not because it's cheaper, though that's a nice extra benefit, because it's where innovation is happening. The good news is it's not that the vendors don't get that anymore. In fact, I think most vendors understand that it is a massive new wave of innovation um, that customers are going to want to consume. And we all have to work to make sure that um, we bring those to market. So, you know, this I just picked up in stack because it's a, you know, a hot one now. But, you know, one of the things I find most interesting around OpenStack, and we can talk about the technology and the fact that it was user-driven and how it started, but I think one of the interesting characteristics is basically the majority of the major IT vendor community has gotten on board in some way. Now, different companies are struggling with, well, what does it mean to support customers if I'm not building and selling intellectual property, right? So different models are emerging. There's the Red Hat model of how we sell subscriptions around stabilized versions and others are doing, you know, support on top of bits. And, you know, over the next decade, I think we're going to see a lot of shakeout among the large IT vendors, primarily because this is the problem they're going to be struggling with, right? It's how do you add value on, uh, when you're not building and selling intellectual property, right? The model's different. The IP's there. You have to say, how do I take the power of that IP and then bring it to customers in a consumable form. The analogy I always think about when I see it is, you know, think of, you know, Niagara Falls or Victoria Falls, all this water kind of coming at you, massive amount of innovation. You want a sip of water, how do you actually get it? And that's a role that vendors have to work to play. And, you know, Red Hat has our model, and I'm not here to talk specifically about Red Hat, but others are going to need to develop models uh, to be sustainable in this because more and more and more innovation is going to happen um, in open networks driven by users and for vendors and frankly in the end for end enterprise IT understanding how you consume that is something that's going to be eating up a lot of time. People don't think of the question that way but in the end that's going to be something that's going to take up a lot of time and energy over the next few years, you know, because I talked about the great things about, you know, open source and, you know, user-driven and distributed and modular, et cetera, et cetera, but what that also means is the majority of people working on those projects are not working on them for sale, and most of them could care less about your needs, as your meaning, you know, enterprise IT needs, they're much more worried about their own employer's needs. And so how you think about driving feature set in, how do you get involved in community, how do you assess what communities get involved in, you know, how do you actually consume it, a um, whole series of issues that enterprises and the IT industry is going to need to work its way through. Right? You know, Red Hat, we've been doing this for quite a while, we think we have a model to do it, but you know, it, this open source is much, much, much bigger than Red Hat alone, and so a lot of people are going to have to uh, understand and work to build their models around it. I'll skip open daylight. This, if you take nothing else from this presentation, um, I would really like you to think about this one, right? And that is that a technology choice today is an innovation model choice for the next decade. And here's what I mean by that. I, I really, I hate to use the word because paradigm shift is overused, but we are in basically a paradigm shift from client server to cloud mobile, right? I know those are all buzzwords and I really hate to use the buzzwords, I really hate buzzwords, but we are moving from application architectures that expected kind of a fat client and communicated back via server to centrally managed data centers for a bunch of reasons, for better utilization, security, it's better for environment, energy uses, etc. So applications running in big centralized data centers that then communicate out with thin devices, i.e. phones, tablets, etc. It could be a browser, right? so it could still be a 
traditional desktop. But generally, applications are moving to being centrally managed within devices that cache some degree of data. That is a radical architecture shift that is as profound as the move to client server. Now, in every kind of new computing paradigm, a set of default choices emerge, right? There's a set of kind of de facto standards that emerge, right? In the mainframe, it's IBM. In client server, Wintel, right? Windows and Intel, those kind of default choices. As we move into this next generation of computing, kind of cloud mobile, a set of default choices are going to emerge. And generally, those default choices persist for a long, long time. Right? If you look back at kind of client server world, I would argue that Linux has done an extraordinary job of proving that it can be the uh, kind of a viable alternative to traditional software. But the default choice is still a Wintel stack, right? And, but if you look at the cloud mobile world, certainly in the web 2.0 world and in the startup world, the default choice is open source. Without it, I cannot imagine a new startup in, pick your place, Silicon Valley or wherever it is, starting up and building on you know, Unix or Windows or anything proprietary. Right? Those, that is the default choice um, for kind of a next generation public cloud kind of world. But frankly, for the traditional enterprise making decisions today, is it going to be a Microsoft stack, a VMware stack, or an open source stack? I don't want to say Red Hat because we play a role in open source broadly. It's frankly still up for grabs. That's to be determined. And while we feel and we have customers running open source stacks, you know, open stack in production, the thing that I always encourage customers to think about is don't make a decision today based on feeds and speeds and you know the Chinese menu of you know this product versus that product. Recognize when you make that decision, you're also making a long-term choice because once you get locked into a technology, you're generally locked in for a long time. Over the next three or four years, as enterprises are making technology stack choices, implicitly when you decide to use an open stack versus, say, vCloud, implicitly you are saying, I believe in an open development model or I believe a single company can be my partner and do innovation better than the rest of the, the community combined. Right? So I encourage any enterprise that's looking to make infrastructure decisions as it moves into a cloud mobile type of world to recognize, to step back, not just think about decision today, you know, hey, I got a VMware infrastructure, it's just easy to add this on top. Think about the model you're getting involved in and think about kind of the innovation model you want to be a part of and the people that, you know, you're expecting to innovate. And bluntly, do you, do you want to be on the same stack that Google and Amazon or Facebook are using? Do you believe that they can actually drive a future of technology? Um, I'm actually going to skip all the blatant sales stuff about Red Hat, but I have two last slides that I want to make sure I do because I know I'm running tight uh, on time. I thought this was an interesting slide, and I really don't want to mention this in regards to Red Hat, but in terms of where the industry is, I think this is a um, relative, pretty fascinating. So this is a, done by Oppenheimer and Company, which is one of the large financial um, you know, kind of, uh, investment banks in the U.S. And so this is a financial analyst doing this research. Right? And basically asked, uh, I believe it was 80 CIOs, yeah, 80 CIOs, who do you think will be the most strategic uh, cloud IT supplier for your organization <coughs> in the next five years? I would assume Red Hat, by the way, rather than Red Hat specifically, that is a proxy for on-premise open source, right? We hope people feel that way about Red Hat. But if you looked at that, you say, it's really interesting, if you look at the top three providers on that list. Amazon's entirely open source. Red Hat is entirely open source. Only IBM, who in a lot of the cloud is betting on OpenStack, which is open source. Really, and Salesforce is software as a service that's built on an open source stack. You're down to number five at Microsoft before you actually have a proprietary vendor showing up is what CIOs at major 
This is in these stage U.S. companies believe to be strategic in their long-term cloud uh, architectures. And so I think the fact that really across the board, uh, enterprise IT is starting to recognize the power of this innovation model. It's not fringe. It's not you know something you know that. Uh, um, that you know, a few people are doing. These are major investment banks, industrial companies, etc. that are basically saying, I'm betting a lot of my strategic future in cloud around open source and open source uh, technologies. Um, as a final thought on this, and I do think this is important because we don't exactly know where the future of technology is going, but that's the point. I don't think any organization knows exactly where the future is going. The, the important part is not to know where the future technology is going. The important part is to make sure that you're involved in communities of the leading IT users who are driving components of that innovation. And together, we will define the future of technology. It's going to be open. It's moving in that direction. Um, it's uh, just a, a fundamental shift from a viable alternative to the default choice. And again, we are, it's the equivalent of 1870 in the Industrial Revolution. If the, uh, if the first 50 years of the Information Revolution were the equivalent of the big industrial factories, finally we're to the point in the Information Revolution. We're at an inflection point, and it is being driven by open. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, hopefully I've sparked a few conversations. Uh, I appreciate seeing this many people here to talk about free software. That's a phenomenal thing, and I think it's uh, an indication of the, the, uh, the power of open source and uh, what we're seeing driving the next generation of computing. So let me say thank you. Thank you for being here, um, and I hope we get a chance to meet a few of you over the course of the day. Thank you.